Welcome back. We're pleased to welcome the new stack's Alex Williams to moderate this panel of upstream project leads and cloud native thought leaders for the Upstream This panel. A few folks here. Uh, Clayton and uh, Craig. No. Craig McClucky. Craig, I'm here. Brandon's here. Craig McClucky. I'm sure these guys would just be happy just to spend the time talking, but right, you know, I mean. Are we starting also we 15 minutes late? <laughs> Everything was late, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. <laughs> There's Craig. No, it's not Craig. Nope, sorry. Oh, false alarm. Who? Yeah. All right. And here's Clayton. I just texted Craig. I'll jump off when Craig shows up. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Alex Williams with the New Stack. Uh, we're a technology news publication. We write about the container ecosystem just a little bit, Kubernetes just a little bit, quite a bit actually. Um, our focus is on application development and management at scale. We focus on explanation and analysis. We're having two pancake breakfasts this week with our pancake robot. So we'll be 3D printing pancakes tomorrow morning and Wednesday morning. So come on by and get a pancake printed. Yeah, the 3D printed pancake from the robot itself. So, talking about robots, here we are. You know, the world of automated services, open source ecosystems, you know, the Kubernetes world. You know, if there are a lot of people here who are, who are customers who may not be as familiar with things, I would just love you guys get your take on things. Where are we right now? Well, you know, what's actually happening in this world? What is it that's interesting to you? And talk a little bit about the dynamics of the ecosystem. Just give people a level set. I have to go first. Yeah. Why don't we start down at Brandon's end so I have time to. Oh, Brandon. I want to come up with a good answer. All right. <laughs> That's great. Test one, two, test, test, test. Test, test. All right. That's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. So that's what we're doing. We're testing everything. Um, so I think the state of the ecosystem today is uh, we've created a really, really powerful platform that you can, um, you can really deploy and manage applications well. Now, the, the, the next step here is that we've developed a powerful platform that has very, very low level primitives. And um, what we're starting to see um, out of the ecosystem is uh, kind of up leveling it, making it easier for people who aren't necessarily the early adopters who initially just fundamentally get it. Um, they're able to more easily map to their existing ways of thinking and um, leverage the platform underneath by taking some of their existing thinkings on how they deploy applications, how they operate those applications, how they monitor those applications. I think that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, I'm gonna sort of echo that a little bit, I guess, but taking a slightly different direction, which is I also think we're starting to see people starting to think about what this means for how they build applications, which is to say like, it started out people just kind of experimenting and playing around and learning some stuff and and in some ways taking what they had and, and putting it into the space. And I think what you're gonna, so it, one of the, the analogies I've drawn in the past is, you know, object-oriented programming mainstreamed, I would say, with C++ sort of in the mid 80s, 85, 86-ish. Um, and then in the early 90s, you see this explosion of patterns books, of people kind of stepping back and doing an analysis of like, okay, we have this new tool how do we build software using this new tool? And I think we're sort of going to start entering into that phase where it's no longer, oh, what is this tool? How do I understand this tool? What do I do with this tool? It starts being like, what are the best practices for this tool? What are the ways that this, you know, what are the patterns that make sense for this world? And I think that's sort of the phase. If I'm looking out into the future, that's sort of the phase where I think we're in where, yeah. Uh, so I think we're in the phase where on the infrastructure side, the patents have expired. You know, the ideas around these things, like this idea that I have a strategic advantage because the way, of I, the way I manage my software or my hardware with my software. 
So you know, we would tease out these white papers, kind of give you clues on some of the design principles, but there was no way most people could actually build an implementation from that. So what we're seeing now, though, instead of a white paper, you're getting an open source project. So Kubernetes represents that kind of open source project around these ideas. So now that the patents are wore off, everyone is able to participate and build on top of them without fear uh, of retaliation and so forth. I was actually gonna, I totally thought you were gonna say we need to explain this to everybody so everybody understands what they have available. So we need to do a lot better job at documenting, describing, explaining, putting patterns in place. Like it has to be communicated, like the, the potential's there, but it's, it's like you say, like the ideas are out there, but they're unevenly distributed. Um, and the other part I think is really important is figuring out how to tie process to this stuff because everybody's process is different and it'll never be the same, but the primitives for process kind of depend on what you're actually doing. You know, if you're dealing with source code and builds, and then you deploy it, the mechanism in the place where you deploy, what kind of process you have, do you test, do you not test, um, how easy does the infrastructure make to test, those sorts of like innovations and in finding ways of uh, explaining and building tools that make it easy to put development processes on top of this infrastructure is, is the other big area that I think is uh, coming up soon. So before I go any further, I probably should introduce our panelists here and the lousy moderator that I am. So Brandon Phillips of CoreOS, we have Brandon Burns of Microsoft, we have Kelsey Hightower of Google, and Clayton Coleman of Red Hat. But what you bring up is, to me, gets to really the heart of how open source communities actually work. And like with new, with like a lot of new kind of involvement in open source, right? So the, the way we think about it at the new stack is like software's at the center of business, right? There's no doubt about it, right? And open source is increasingly at the center of software. So if that is the case, then that means a lot of changes for both the, you know, for how actually how the software's built and how it's supported and how it's managed and how it's deployed and all and, and, and everything else around it. And a lot of a lot of companies out there are really not accustomed to this kind of this new kind of world. How do you guys balance that? What are the, some of the things that you're trying to do to help people, you know, to, to help manage this process with them? Because there's lots of different dy dy dynamic factors here, such as economic interests that you guys have as, as vendors. There's, there's the expense requirements that the, that the customers have. There's a lot of different, actually, um, uh, dynamics here that I think have to be taken into consideration. I'm just curious on your guys' perspectives on that. I think uh, one thing that I always try and keep in mind is that none of this is new. That like we always like to like everything old is new again, and I think you know this has been alluded to is most of the patterns are things that we in instinctively understand, and a lot of the the easiest way to bridge that gap is to help people find the metaphors and the patterns that move them from where they are. So how do you find them? Help how do you help them find the metaphors and the patterns? Well, and I think you know uh, as an example, containers as a pattern are really just virtualization taken one step further. And so I've had, I can't even count the number of discussions I've had where someone says, well, what's this whole container thing? I said, well, do you remember what it was like to virtualize your software? And for some sets of people, that was all they needed to hear was like, oh, we'll just go do that again. Well, what's the, wh what are the things that are different? And putting it in that frame of context, I think has been something that's very common for, for me, at least on, um, from the Red Hat and OpenShift side. Uh, so I think when you, when you talk about how open source has influenced software and how software is influencing business, uh, I think it's the same thing that kind of happened to the music industry. I think we are no longer under the control of a few select vendors who can actually get software onto the shelves. So we're in the GitHub era, right? So the GitHub era is very similar to the YouTube era. Even if without a record deal, you can make an album and release the whole thing on YouTube or your website. And if you become popular, that's it. You get to go on tour. You may not make very much money on your album sales, very similar to software. You can't really sell packaged software anymore. But you can actually start to dominate and get whatever you want out into a community and see adoption probably even quicker than the old distribution mechanisms of strength software. So I think right now is anyone, any single person, I think Docker is a great example. It wasn't one of the big vendors that came out with Docker, right? This was kind of like almost a side project, implementation detail of a much larger system that was put out there on GitHub, and it exploded across the world with no major influence, really, uh, from the vendors. I think the vendors came in and made it, made it work, right? Like the big tours need help. But I think that is an example that now, as new ideas come out, there is no one gating when these new ideas get to be released. You know, someone else is probably working on the next thing, 
And when it ships on GitHub and if it takes off, everyone will have to either react or actually earn credibility in those communities to actually help um, kind of shift that direction where it needs to go. So when you get into open source, you know, when you get into these open source ecosystems, as you know, Brandon was saying, especially in Kubernetes, you have these, you know, it gets, it gets very, there's some real deep complexities here. So Brandon, I'm curious in your perspective and how you, you know, how you take that into consideration as well. Sure, I think actually in many respects, the whole goal was to make it easier. I don't know if, if, if we succeeded. Um, maybe, I, maybe we're continuing to try and make it succeed. And um, I think that you do have to learn some new ideas. Um, just as if you were going from an you know imperative C, you have to learn about this like what's this class thing, like why why should I care? What's inheritance? There's there's extra stuff to learn, but I think at the limit, what you actually realize once you learn those things and once you start building patterns based on those things is it's actually easier, right? It's gotten it's harder to have your code sprawl if somebody tells you like you have to organize your code into this thing that we're going to call an object and it kind of should have a meaning and it's going to have a name that kind of defines what it is. Um, and I think more importantly, and I think this is also about the open source community, by doing that, suddenly we started talking and identifying that we had the same objects. And we were like, oh, you have a, you know, a, a foo over there? Well, I have a foo over here. And like, as I developed my foo, it turns out that this is a best practice. And that's, and so I think there was more learning. I think when we moved to having shared knowledge and shared words that we used for our infrastructure, we started learning more collectively and we started being able mm. to reuse stuff. So I think the first wave of this was sort of the library era or suddenly like you could reuse a library, right? Like there was this thing that was out there that had a, this documentation and these objects that you could pull in and you could treat it independent from the rest of your code base and we started collaborating with these libraries and I think now we're just getting to a place where we're collaborating with the way that we build and deploy our infrastructure. Um, and I think the net of that is actually a win for most businesses because you go from a bunch of like localized areas of knowledge to a place where we're collaborating on knowledge and best practices around the world. So I feel like we're developing this shared vocabulary that helps us sort of up-level everybody um, by talking about the same thing. So if I may just ask a follow-up question for you, Brandon. So, so you're with Microsoft now, and you work on Azure, and Kubernetes, and, and Azure, right? So that shared language that you're discussing here, and that knowledge, how is that transpiring into, into your own development? The, uh, on top of the Azure project. Well, I mean, I guess I the other thing I would say is, that is a truism sort of points to what Kelsey said as well, which is um, I don't think anybody in infrastructure wants to get locked in again, right? I think that it's very clear this open source thing has made everybody realize that there is actually a place where their code can go anywhere. And for a vendor of data centers, effectively, which is what we are, um, that means we have to provide a really, really great data center, right? Great performance at a great price and all that sort of stuff. and that means, I mean, at some level, it's it's harder, you know, uh, f as a, as a business, right? Because people can take their business anywhere with the, with Kubernetes, but um, it, it also means we produce better products for people. So I think it, it's a win for everybody in the end. But but Brandon, it's still a market game, right? There's still there's still market forces here. You're you're venture funded, right? There's how do you determine what actually you put into the projects and whether you keep for yourselves? What are what's that balance you form with the community? Yeah. So when when I think about doing open source work, and I think a lot of people think this way, is you are looking at how do you enable capability. So if you look at, like, say, that what's the difference between an Android device and the Linux kernel? Like, the Linux kernel enables a lot of different capabilities, and the Android, like, when you get an Android device, there's actually a finished product that, like, leads you to an end-to-end -end experience. Um, and I think that's, that's really the difference when people are thinking about when they c contribute to an open source community or how they engage and balance that between um, their business interests and their and the overall open source community interests. It's how do we create these kind of shared languages and these shared patterns and how do we make that something that ensures that the customer and the ecosystem doesn't get locked into any single vendor? How do we ensure that capability ends up in the open source project? And then when you're doing that whole process, how does that actual capability end up creating like an end-to-end -end experience for the user that's like compelling and solves the problem that they have? Um, and generally, it's like very niche, specialized problems. Um, as the Kubernetes community is sort of this general platform today, uh, a lot of those problems are really integration problems. How do I integrate with my storage? How do I integrate with my identity? How do I integrate with uh, my security and compliance? But over time, it'll be more about, um, you know, how do I integrate with my existing applications, integrate with the middleware investments that I've made and that sort of stuff. So it's, 
it's really it's really about the the capability versus the actual like end product experience and like the deliverable value. So with that, so with that that product experience, correct, right? So so let's uh, you know hypothetically we have a customer out there and there's all these companies competing right for that same customer, and we have open source projects and the open source projects um, are are you know are, are fairly open and you know those those customers can go upstream whatever they want and basically kind of like say oh I can you know I can work on this why should I work you know why should I work with you I'm you know I, that that seems like you know where where is that where where is that balance there yes for a lot of people like the reason they they, they turn to any vendor for open source software is because um, just because it's open source doesn't mean that you have expertise or want to build that expertise or it actually makes business sense for you to build that expertise on that software and so like a very common thing is um, with our first product, CoreOS Linux, like people don't want to build expertise on like rolling out and testing Linux kernels. Um, so we have that expertise, and so we provide that as a service, and then people, uh, they si subscribe essentially to that service, and they get it delivered. And I think similarly, like you have to make smart business choices. Like it doesn't make sense always to build a team of 10 engineers that are focusing on making Kubernetes great instead of making your product great. Kelsey, what are your thoughts? Um, so we've seen this shift a bit in some of the larger businesses where um, given the same scenario, you may say if I'm paying $10 million on licensing, how many developers can I hire? And if you're smart, you go to GitHub and you look at the names. Like, wow, you hate your company. You really hate your current employer because I can see that all of your commits come at 7 p.m. <laughs> so these are prime hires. I think Facebook was a good example of bringing in some of the Postgres core members, right? I'm not saying that they hated their former companies, but sometimes it's cheaper to hire the core maintainers, have them on site, and when you do that, you have the responsibility of allowing them to continue to contribute to that community. Red Hat is probably the biggest example of something like this, right? Like Red Hat is able to enter new spaces by going in and saying, you know, Red Hat could partner with some of these other projects and have them be standalone. But it, I've noticed a pattern of Red Hat just independently, that they build up that army of expertise and gain um, you know, respect with that community either by being direct contributors or hiring in the entire team, CentOS. You bring the whole team over. Um, so that strategy, I think, is some other enterprises are also looking at that strategy. Like if you're all in on some technology and it can sink your business if it goes away, Sometimes you're in your best interest just to buy the entire. We're seeing that, aren't we? In the startup community, I mean, there's been exam there's been lots of examples. Samsung acquired Joint, right? So you start to negotiate that deal. You're like, that's the invoice you're going to send me. How much is your net worth? I'm just going to buy the whole thing, and then we're going to charge it back. But I think a really, I would say a really interesting point to that is that there are typically fixed pools of experience in these sorts of areas, yeah. and I think that's one of the challenges. Is if you think about acquisitions like that, where you hire an entire group of developers, and if you aren't responsible, as uh, Brendan and Brandon were alluding to, to making them available for other companies, you've essentially locked an asset away that you might have been dependent on. And I think that's one of the challenges and risks that we see in open source is there's this tension, this, this growing tension, you know, there's the startup funded open source, right. there's maybe more like the classic vendors like Red right. Hat, and there's always a tension between how much are you willing to bet on a particular technology? So Kubernetes right. is a great example of something that's so big now that it's a really easy bet to say, you know, I might hire someone who's specialized in Kubernetes. Whereas on the other extreme, some of the smaller technologies that Kubernetes contributes to or that are people use with Kubernetes, um, making sure there's a broad enough pool of people who are willing to commit in the open to support that technology. And that's kind of, I, you know, I, to, I won't shill for Red Hat here, even though that's technically my job. Um, <laughs> But you know that idea of working and being responsible in the communities is something I think everybody on this panel absolutely believes in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every every one of these guys has demonstrated being responsible in these communities to ensure that we create a more vibrant ecosystem. Even though you know there might be specific vendor um, goals that may run against us, I think everybody has kind of demonstrated that level of professionalism. Any questions? Yes. Um, 
So I, I think there's like a, a few lessons to be learned there. And one of which is uh, you need people from the beginning who care about ensuring that the governance of the important bits of intellectual property are well governed from the beginning. And I think that's probably the lesson that um, was learned here and that like the CNCF and Kubernetes community overall has been really uh, conscious and careful to ensure that not just like the community as a software project is doing well, but the community as a marketing and brand um, are doing well together as, um, as kind of a cohesive package of uh, like a, a single face forward. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think it's also the case that you have to set up, and sort of alluding to what Clayton said, you have to set up this community so that it can resist any one particular interest, right? Like it's sort of like setting up the checks and balances in any sort of good governance that you want to understand what it, what the community means and ensure that you can, that it will continue to function no matter where any of us goes, right? And how that do you up. balance that then with the rest of the community that encompasses other organizations as well because there's such a crossover between different communities and one may be entirely dependent on the other. So I think Node.js was a good example of fork the whole thing, <laughs> right? Fork it, go do something else, and push it harder than what you thought you saw before because that's also the other power of open source. You know, some of these licenses are tailored around that, that we won't always agree. And you have the power to hit that fork button and kind of continue off in a different, you know, a different route. And we have to be okay with that. The good thing about Node.js, it was brought back when Joint decided that having two communities around the project was not uh, in the best interest of everyone involved. So I think a lot of times that fork button is really what allows that community to actually have some say, right? It gives you that real power to fork and move uh, development where you see it. So it kind of evens the playing field for everyone. Even a lone developer can hit that button. So I think and it keeps everyone in check. There's the fork and then there's a metaphorical fork. Fork right? it all, man. Fork. Fork well, it. And, <laughs> and I think this is really, I think this is like to a deeper point as well around like the health of an ecosystem is how diverse it is right. and how resilient it is to any particular point of failure. And like it's it's a very conscious decision in the Kubernetes community to try and be as um, diverse of interest as possible or as diverse an interest as possible to ensure that as, Brand, uh, as Brendan was saying, that the more that we can create some uh, an ecosystem where everybody is able to participate and find individual value, we're more healthy as a general community because we can resist individual um, failures. Who's a customer out here? Who are like actually work? You know, even if you work at Ray, ha raise your hand because then it won't look cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just want to get a kind of a glimpse of who who's out here. Do you have a question about this at all? No. Okay, that's fine. Um, Okay, so then the question that I ask then is, okay, you say, just say fork it, okay. So, so what happens when you are, you know, that when there's two kind of, there's a dependency between, for instance, two open source organizations, right? And then, and, and you're, maybe you're, um, uh, what, what you're trying to get, what, what you're trying to get through one community actually doesn't get accepted, right? I'm gonna answer that. So I think the biggest problem is what causes the forks. Usually forks are caused when there is no way to get the change you want to happen. And I think, I think uh, Kubernetes did a really good job of saying, we're gonna make all this kind of API driven. You can add what feels like core functionality. I think third party resources, one of the biggest things that uh, Brendan championed. You saw CoreOS just release this thing called operators. And CoreOS was able to do that without recompiling all of Kubernetes, getting the whole Kubernetes by community to agree that they could even use this term they were able to put that out without in the open because the APIs are there. So APIs, to me, remove a lot of tension from these projects. Okay, so then they remove a lot of tension from those projects, and what about, you know, what, what about then the, the Docker in the mix of all this, right? Woo, Dodge. All right, so. I, I, had, I had to ask, I had to ask. So <laughs> I, get to, I get to follow up the Node.js one, which is I think the best thing about this industry, if you wait a few years, it all changes and everyone forgets everything that happened two years ago. So I think one of the, one of the things that makes this particular area so interesting is the amount of people involved from a whole subset of communities, which Docker is fantastic. Docker has done things that have enabled technologies. There's lots of other people who've done that before, and there'll be lots of people who do that after. And I think one of the things is, is that even when there may be disagreements between communities 
or interests, what inevitably happens is that people take the fundamental technologies and they rebuild things that enable them. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. And the goal is to try and build these ecosystems that survive even disruptive changes like that. Do customers have any questions about this at all, about, about this actual dynamic here? Any other questions from the audience? No one wants to get in the middle of this one. Anyone? OK. I mean, the, the doctor thing is interesting. Wait, we got a question oh. over here. Pass it to you in a second. So th I think that's a good point. And I think the problem in the specific. Uh, so, the, so the question is that if Docker is the foundation and Kubernetes and OpenShift on top, and if Docker becomes brittle or fragmented, then you lose the investment upstream. So sum it up. And I think here is that in this particular case, and not, and not all of Docker, but I think people really weren't clear on what the foundation actually was. In the case of Docker, the foundation was the Linux kernel, and it's still there, and it's still open, and it still has the API. So everything that allowed Docker to exist, allowed LXC to exist, allows Rocket to exist, and you're gonna see this even at Microsoft, they have their own container implementation that's close to their, their OS. So I think a lot of times, I think we all lost track of where the foundation was. So it did feel very shaky because you're just standing on the subfloor, right? There's concrete underneath there. And the kernel is pretty solid. And the good thing about the kernel is that there are a lot of people who understand how to add that value. So I think the reason why we're all pretty confident upstream is that there are enough people in the industry to support a very stable foundation. And actually, what you actually need is a lot less than what people saw in Docker. Docker is great because it gives you that developer workflow, it gives you all these other tools, but that work that's going on in the open container initiative to take those parts that are the foundation, the image format, things that we rely on, some of the APIs, to allow those pieces to work with any OS level thing. So I believe truly that your investment is safe because a lot of us, and we're, we're out here educating more and more to show people where the actual foundation is, so find comfort in that. So Brendan, why? I was going to say, the one, the one other thing I would say is that of all of the pieces that I think are baked, it's the image format, right? Like, I, I, I don't see, because of the investment you're talking about, I don't see people moving very much away from that, at least not in incompatible ways. Um, and I think that the core, because of that, I think that investment, actually, that shared fate actually makes the community stronger, right? Because it means that any particular actor can't twist it to their particular goals because there's so much shared investment that the community will resist. Um, and so I think that that's the other part of it, which is that the runtime might change, the way that you build the images might change, but the actual images that you have built and placed out into a repository somewhere, I don't think that's changing much. It's going to iterate maybe, but it's not going to go away. La I last think was, thing. I, was, I think it's actually really smart because most of the technologies that we're talking about are not very complex technologies um, in terms of their independent pieces. So like the registry and the image format is a great example. Just a bunch of tar files and a manifest. And we can pretty it up and format it and standardize it and make tools that work with it pretty easily. But I have no... I have no concerns that there's gonna be some massive disruption in either image format or container running that are gonna really impact people up the stack because like that's the beauty of open source. Like, you know, regardless of whether anyone forks, you can just keep using the old version that's supported by like a half dozen distros at this point. Um, if and you know, there's always going to be time to react to these things, and that's part of what I think everybody on this panel's job is to do. Um, the reason why we get paid is to help create stability. Um, in those communities. And, and last thing, let's be sure, even though Docker isn't up here, they are very much a part of this. They are contributing to the OCI spec. You see their names. I always check the commit messages to see who's participating. The Docker engineers are participating. We may not all agree on everything. Even between companies that aren't Docker, we don't agree on everything. So they are participating. So it's not that you know it's like everyone against Docker. 
right? Docker does a great deal of work across the board. So let's be sure of that, that the engineering work that's going on to make all the statements we say true, Docker is totally participating. They're not isolated from this. Great. Well, thank you guys very much for participating in a very interesting discussion here. And uh, look forward to having more discussions. And you're going to be following up with the discussion on the container ecosystem, aren't you? Yes. Yes. So, right. so who would like to see a 3D printed pancake made by a robot tomorrow? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Hope to see you there in the morning then. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks.